Okay. Um, so if you would turn to page 53 and for our opening prayer. Creating and loving God, as we read your word together, may we allow it to read us. As we enter into your story, may we understand our own stories with more clarity and wisdom. Help us to remember that you have always worked through the lives of ordinary women and men with all their faults and failings. People like us, we bring our ordinary lives before you today, transform our expectations so that as we study stories of the past, we may be open to your extraordinary future. Amen. All right. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a screen share and ask that those of you who are um, not not to mute yet because I just want to look at this picture and get some feedback from you all. This yes. is the artwork that goes with the lesson. So I just want you to take a couple minutes or a few seconds to look at this and tell me what you see in there. Todd? Yes. That was Helen. She didn't get the invitation. Um, can I do that? Yeah, you should be able to just forward it to her. Um, how do I get back to that? Let's see. Okay, wait a minute. Maybe if I Hold do that. Hold on. I can, let me see if I can find it. Um, let's see. Hmm. Um, I don't know how to do it and not. I got it. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, wait a minute. What's Helen's email address? Um, here, wait a minute. Let me see. I can forward. I've got it in mind to Helen. Okay, I did it. Okay. <laughs> well, would that be King David and Bathsheba? And on the right, um, the general husband, Naaman, or Nay, I forget his name. And then the, the baby that didn't survive. Mm. Okay. I wondered about that baby picture, if that weren't the first baby, the one that didn't live. Mm-hmm some hardworking hands, and I didn't get the impression, memory doesn't serve, that Bathsheba would have had hardworking hands. Well, as the, as the wife of an army general who was off to war a lot, maybe, maybe so early on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody else? I wasn't thinking about Uriah, but that's a good, um, that's the, yeah, Uriah. Um, for some reason, I was thinking about Solomon when he was older and that Bathsheba was still holding on to the baby picture of that first baby for uh -huh. the grief that she still had, but who knows, you're right, it could be Uriah. All right, anybody else? I just sent the invitation to Phyllis, too. Okay. All right. I'm going to take down that picture, and we're going to take off through the story because it's a wild story. Um, all right. <clears throat> one sentence I wanted to share with you because a few weeks ago, on one of the Presbyterian leaders page, there was a pastor who was obviously preparing for this upcoming lesson. Um, and she posted to the leaders page asking for comments. She said, what do you want people to know about Bathsheba? And then she added, let me rephrase that. What do you think of when you think of Bathsheba? And what is the most important thing about her? And she got about close to 40 comments from different people. But the thing that came to me, because I was already reading a lesson, trying to figure out 
how I was going to teach this. I said, she is a tower of tenacity in a world of subterfuge, a beacon of hope in a life scarred with despair. So that was my take on who Bathsheba is. Um, there are basically three stories in scripture where Bathsheba's name is mentioned and she is a character in the story. Of course, the first one is quite long one that we will look at. And then we'll look at the other two that she's mentioned in. But the only other place other than those three stories where the name Bathsheba is listed in scripture is in Psalm 51. And it's not actually in the scripture. It's in the, the header that was added later by scholars uh, because they understood Psalm 51 to be about written by David. And so on the header in some Bibles on Psalm 51, it says to the leader, that is to the leader of worship who would be leading people in chanting or reading or singing this Psalm, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. All right. So, we have the Bathsheba stories, and um, I just want to go through and mention a few things that are in the story and tell you about that. Um, it starts out in the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, so we've already been through Saul the king. We know that David was, was anointed by God as the king to come after Saul, um, and, and one of the stark differences between Saul and David is that as the story is told about them, um, the narrator of the story says that the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul when he was named king, but it says later that the spirit of the Lord left him. But when the narrator talks about the spirit of the Lord coming upon David, it says, and the, and the spirit of the Lord remained with him for the rest of his life. Uh, so this is a different kind of king and yet we have this story of Bathsheba. Um, it says, the narrator is very clear, it says, in the time of year when kings go out to battle, guess where David was? Not out to battle. He was sitting at home. As a matter of fact, the narrator even says, late one afternoon when he rose from his couch, and if that doesn't give you a picture of some lazy person just lying around having figs dropped into their mouth, by some little servant there who's there to do their entire bidding. I don't know what does. But he rises from his couch and he goes to the roof of his palace so that he can look out over the kingdom. But he does not look out over the kingdom. What he does is peer into the yard of somebody near the palace. And it happens to be Uriah's house where Bathsheba is. Now, folks, years ago, people tried to make it out that Bathsheba was bathing on her roof. Not true. The text says David saw her from his roof. So you might say that the first peeping Tom was a peeping Dave. And he's looking down at Bathsheba here, and he sees that she's a beautiful woman, so he inquires about her. And the narrator gives us two names for her daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah is one of the soldiers that is out doing David's bidding when the king is supposed to be out to battle, but he's not. Um, and David sends for her as if she has an option. She has to come to him when, when um, he is sent for. And David then does what we know he did with her. The narrator says, he lay with her, and we all know what that means. Um, but it says that she returned to her house, and it makes it sound like it was immediate. But I got to tell you, if you do the biology and the birds and the bee thing, if she was if she was purifying herself after her period, he must she must have stayed there longer than one night in order to become pregnant. At least that's the way I understand the way the medical stuff works. So anyway, Bathsheba goes home. And as she turns out that she's pregnant, she sends a message to David 
And it's interesting, very, very straightforward. I am pregnant. What I think she probably wanted to say was, you got me pregnant because no woman gets pregnant by herself. So this is about David as much as it is about Bathsheba. And David has some plans for how he's going to deal with that. So he sends for Uriah, bring him back from the war, brings him in and chats with him. How are things going with the war, Uriah? And Uriah tells him all about it. And he says, go down to your house and wash your feet. Well, in the Hebrew scriptures, your feet doesn't always mean your feet. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But David, uh, David doesn't know that Uriah is a very loyal soldier. And he realizes that all of his soldier friends are out still in, in battle. And he's not going to go home. And in fact, he sleeps on David's couch or at his porch. And David finds out about it the next day and is not happy. So he has to go to plan B. And plan B is to get Uriah drunk in hopes that he will go home and lie with his wife. And that doesn't even work. So David has to go to plan C, which is to send a sealed note to Joab, the, the leader of the army, that very straightforwardly says, I want Uriah to die. Joab doesn't know why. Um, I don't think he cares for it very much, but he knows he has to follow orders because he is a soldier. So he follows the orders. Uriah is killed. He sends a messenger back. And there's this crazy part in um, 2 Samuel 11, verse 20, uh, where Joab is giving the messenger instructions. And he brings in this story from the ninth chapter of Judges about Abimelech who actually gets killed when he goes up to a city wall and a woman throws a millstone down on him and kills him. He brings that into the story as if that's something David's going to ask the, the messenger. Uh, and I think what he's doing there is giving us allusion to the fact that Bathsheba, the woman, by what David has done, so it's actually David who's done this, has created Uriah's death. But the messenger goes back and David doesn't say anything. And, and of course, he gets the message, Uriah the Hittite is dead. So um, Bathsheba goes through her mourning. David brings her into the house. And lo and behold, she has a baby. Um, so um, after that, um, the end of chapter 11 is quite interesting. It ends in the middle of a sentence. And it says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Well, that is a very, let's say, a milk toast interpretation of the Hebrew word. It's not displeased. The Hebrew word means evil and wicked. So the thing that David had done was evil and wicked in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and that's where the prophet Nathan shows up. Nathan is very involved in this whole story. And Nathan should be involved because the first prophet who helped guide the kings of Israel, Samuel, has passed away now. And, and there was no mention of who was going to be the next prophet. But Nathan is the one that's trying to keep the king straight. So he goes to David and um, he tells him this story. And of course, David, you know, assumes that the story is about someone else, but it's a story about him. It's about a rich man who decided to slaughter the, the ewe lamb, the baby lamb of uh, a poor man. And it was the only lamb he had. And he did that to feed one of his rich friends who came over. Um, interesting in the lesson that, um, we are reminded that there is some wordplay, some sound uh, that's very similar from you lamb to the name Bathsheba. And I don't think I told you before, but Bathsheba actually means um, someone who is born of a promise, I think it is, or a covenant. Uh, so this, so when Nathan uses his description of this lamb that is sacrificed, um, it sounds a lot like Bathsheba's name, but David misses it altogether. He doesn't catch it. And so David gets really 
angry and he says, the person who's done this deserves to die. And just like in the movies, Nathan turns and says, you are the man. And then David realizes what he's done and realizes that Nathan knows this and realizes that he has sinned against God. And I have to say that it has to be the spirit of God upon him that causes him to recognize his failure here. Um, so he admits it. And um, Nathan says, well, guess what? The sword is never going to depart from your life. And that's part of why, of course, David is not allowed to build the temple. And it ends up Solomon being uh, the one that builds the temple. And, and my least favorite part of the story is where Nathan says that this child born from your illicit relationship is going to die because of what you've done. Um, I really don't like it when God says that. And sometimes it makes me wonder very deeply whether or not that's the interpretation of the narrator and not what God said, but we're not going to go there today. Uh, so we know, as, as Lucretia said, as we were looking at the picture, this little baby picture that is held up in the artwork perhaps could very well be this first child that did not survive. And the second child, of course, that Bathsheba had is the one uh, who is Solomon. So, um, Anyway, the story goes on and we get over to uh, the part where Bathsheba comes back into the story. Because in the meantime, in the story that we did not read, um, we have um, one, another one of David's sons, his fourthborn before the Bathsheba incident named Absalom who actually challenged David and, and decided that he was going to be king. And David had to send out his forces to fight against Absalom, Absalom. But when he sent him out, he told him, he said, do not harm my son Absalom. Even though he is fighting against me and wants to be king, I do not want him killed. He's my own son. Um, and it just so happens, if you believe in just so happens, that Joab is the same army commander that's out there while they are fighting Absalom. And apparently Absalom has some very long and beautiful hair. And as he was riding along on his donkey, his hair gets caught up in the branches of a tree and the donkey keeps running and Absalom is left suspended between heaven and earth in the tree branch by his hair. And David's soldiers come along and um, led by Joab, they kill Absalom. And then they go back and tell David, and he is very mournful. Um, he cries and mourns, and he can't believe that Joab has done this. But I got to believe that when Joab had the conversation, um, maybe he brought up Uriah and said, well, you're willing to kill somebody else, <laughs> somebody else's husband. Uh, and Absalom was a threat to your throne, and so we killed him. So that part has happened in the meantime. And then there becomes another, um, another son who has attempted to um, become the king. And this son's name is Adonijah. But what happens before this, which is very telling in the book of uh, First Kings, is that we get a very vivid description of how old and decrepit David is at this time. He's so old and he's always cold and they can't warm him up. Remember, this was before electric blankets. So they had to do something. And somebody's bright idea was, well, let's get a beautiful young woman to come lie in bed with him and she'll be his bed warmer. And so they get Abishag, who was apparently a beautiful young virgin, and they tell her, well, you have to go lie with King David to try and keep him warm so he doesn't shiver when he's trying to sleep. So that's the David where we are now when we come into the second part of the story of Bathsheba. And that is, again, Nathan the prophet comes in and is the one that comes to Bathsheba and says, you have to go talk to David because Adonijah, another son, has already declared that he's king, he's got soldiers, he's got weapons, he's got chariots, and he's out there ready to take over. And here's old David in here, 
lying in the bed with this young woman, can't even stop shivering, and he's the king. How is he going to defend himself? We got to do something about this. So Nathan goes to Bathsheba and says to her, you have to go into David and say to him, remember, you promised that Solomon was going to be king. Well, here's the real stickler of the story. Nowhere in the book of 1 Kings does David tell Bathsheba that Solomon is going to be king. And yet Nathan tells her to go in and tell him this. Now, it gets really complicated, and I'll very quickly stop and explain that to you. Because there are basically two narratives of the kings and the nations of Israel that are in Scripture. First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings is one combined narrative of four different books. And that's, of course, where our story is. But the book of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, is another one that tells basically the same stories, but some of them quite differently. And the reason that those stories are different is because they were actually recorded, that is written down for the first time, a hundred years apart. Um, the Samuel books and the King books, first and second Kings, were written down during the Babylonian exile. And so as a way to remind the exiles of why they were sent into exile, the books of first, second Samuel, first, second Kings tell the story of the kings and the nation's failure to follow God. After they returned from exile, a hundred years later, the books of first and second Chronicles were written and they were written more with a focus toward trying to get people to return to God. So you've got one set, one set of the story written to describe how people wandered away from God and the latter part reminding them to return to God. Well, it is in the book of Chronicles. I think it's chapter 22 or 23 in first Chronicles where God tells David, your son Solomon is going to be the king that sits on your throne. So we don't even have that in the book of Kings. But Nathan comes to Bathsheba and says, you have to go into the king and remind him, remind him of something he may not have ever said. But you know how that goes. If you remind somebody enough of something they never said, they believe they said it. And so she goes in and tells David, you know, um, Adonijah is out here threatening your kingdom and you promised Solomon that he was going to be king. You need to do something about it. And it's all a perfect plan because as she is telling him this, Nathan comes in and not only backs up her story, but adds a lot of um, adds a lot to it by saying, oh, yeah, Ad Adonijah's out there and he's about to take he's about to take over the kingdom. You need to do something. And so, in fact, David does get up somehow and says, yes, I named Solomon king and he's the one that's going to be king. So that's the second story of Bathsheba, where she, in essence, steps up boldly uh, to speak for her son, Solomon, uh, and that is what gets him to the throne. Now, the third story of Bathsheba is uh, a story much later after Solomon becomes king. And another, this same Adonijah, who was not killed somehow by David or Solomon early on, Adonijah decides that, well, you remember that little girl that was a bed warmer for David, Abishag? Adonijah decides that he needs her for a wife, but he knows that he has to have Solomon's approval for that. So he goes to Bathsheba and says, you know, things would go a lot better for Solomon if he let me marry Abishag. And so Bathsheba goes in to Solomon and says to him, you know, it might help um, calm the divide between you and the other sons, especially Adonijah, the other sons of David. Because, by the way, if you do the math, I think David had 19 sons altogether. Only four of them by Bathsheba, not counting the one who died. So five total from Bathsheba. Uh, but another uh, 14 from other women and a lot of them were older than Solomon and would have been in line for succession before Solomon. So there's a lot of trauma going on here. <clears throat> but she says to 
uh, Solomon, she says, well, you know, if you let Adonijah marry this little girl, Abishag, who was David's bed warmer, uh, then that might help, you know, help calm the troubled waters between the two of you. And um, Solomon's response to that is, uh, I think it's time to have Adonijah killed. So Bathsheba did not succeed in convincing him, but I really wonder whether she wanted to at all or not. She may have just gone in and you know how you can say things in a way that makes people think about what they're really doing. Um, I wonder if Bathsheba did not use her wisdom and her skill to help Solomon see what Ad Adonijah was trying to do to him because he still had eyes for the kingdom. That's for sure. Um, so that's the story of Bathsheba, an amazing woman. And as a closing, I want to read you something that I found months ago and saved because I thought it was so valuable. Um, there's a Canadian author and blogger um, who writes on Christian women's spirituality whose name is Anne Boskamp. Um, I've read a number of, not the books that she's read, but she's written. She's written a number of books, but I've read some pieces that she's written. And, um, and this right here that somebody shared months ago, I say, because I thought this is what this, what my grandmother's taught me in the story and the Bible study that we're having is all about. Here's what she writes. She says, these four women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Well, that's our study so far. The only one left is Mary. She says, these four <clears throat> have something in common. They are grandmothers in Jesus's family tree. Grandmothers. Some had affairs. Some were prostitutes. Some lied and were not the starry-eyed, perfect princesses. But God still chose them. These four broken women. That's why they have crowns. A symbol of grace and love from our creator and redeemer. The family tree of Christ startlingly notes not one woman, but four, four broken women who felt like outsiders, like has-beens, like never-beens. Women who were weary of being taken advantage of, of being unnoticed, uncherished, and unappreciated. Women who didn't fit in, didn't know how to keep going or what to believe, where to go. Women who thought about giving up, and yet Jesus claims exactly these women. Wandering, wondering, wounded, and worn out, and his. He grafts you into his line, into his story, and into his heart. He gives you, all of you, his name, his lineage, and his righteousness.